This is Tom Eggleston. I'm HHS staff and a non-moding member of the advisory committee. And the rest of you are going to have to unmute and then identify yourselves. Carl Peters, <laughs> I think I'm as an industry member, Recology General Manager. Sandra? I'm Sandra Smith, uh, one of my general public person. <laughs> uh, I'm incorporated in Washington County. <laughs> Sue? Sue Shade? Sue Shade, public member. Kim? You're muted. Okay. I don't know if you want to be. There you go. And Kim Bestigal, I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Washington County Solid Waste. Jennifer? Hi, Jennifer Stefanik with Washington County Solid Waste and Recycling. I'm the Green Business Coordinator. And Vinod? Uh, Vinod Singh, industry member, Far West Recycling, in, and also unincorporated Washington County. Beth? Beth Vargas Duncan, industry representative, uh, Washington County Haulers Association. And Kathy? Kathy Folsom, Kathy Washington Christy County. Kathy public member. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> It's okay, we two Kathy's. Sorry about that. So Kathy Christie and Kathy Folsom. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> who, Tom, you gonna do pro program updates? Sounds good. Um, some quick program updates. Um, a couple things on the list here. So I'll give a quick update on the service termination moratorium. Um, talked about last uh, meeting, we have made an agreement with the Washington County Haulers Association that they would pause um, service cutoff, service terminations due to the COVID impacts. Um, we continue to work with the Hauler Association um, through the month of July, and we have reached an agreement that we would um, continue to do that through September 30th. Um, so the Hauler Association um, graciously agreed to carry forward into September 30th. That aligns up with the state um, moratorium on evictions. <clears throat> so September 30th is coming at us really fast. It's kind of crazy to say that. It's already almost middle of August. Um, so part of that um, conversation revolved around the next item on the update is that um, we are working on developing a garbage and recycling bill assistance fund. Um, we might have mentioned this last time too. So part of the conversation with the Hauler Association is that we wanted some time to get some funds together from the county's um, coronavirus relief fund um, that came from the CARES Act. And we have gathered um, at this point have been allocated $120,000 to enter into a contract with Community Action, which is a community-based organization in Hillsborough. And we will have a fund that is available to community members that cannot afford their garbage service. So when, uh, when we get into the end of September and, we, and the, the letters start going out again, letting folks know that their service may be interrupted for non-payment, there's gonna be an opportunity for those folks to get into this program and have their, um, be able to, if they're eligible, have their bills paid by Community Action. So it's an exciting program. We have four of the nine haulers have already signed agreements with Community Action. Um, we're moving along pretty good. Um, the county is finalizing its contract with Community Action as well, and we're looking forward to seeing how it plays out. It'll, it'll be the first um, one that we're aware of in the state and the first one in the region for sure that's um, set up like this. In, in the past, um, non-payment of bills, if, the, if it was a renter at least, that fell back on the landowner or the landlord, to, to make up the difference. Is that going to continue to be the case so that the, the, this fund is a, basically a rainy day fund only as a last resort if nobody else is available, no, no other pockets are available? Well, so it, it's really a, a low income assistance program. So it's modeled after energy um, assistance programs. So it's not only for folks that are gonna be um, service terminated. That's, that's gonna be one of the main ways they find out about it. We're going to be communicating with community members through the notices of past due um, bills and accounts. So normally, um, my understanding is normally if a renter is late or a renter doesn't um, pay their bills and they say leave, the property owner is ultimately responsible for the, for the bill pursuant to our rules. But most of the time, my understanding is the service providers will try to collect from the individual that set up the account. So if the renter set it up, the accountant in their name, they're going to try to collect from those, those individuals. If that's not successful and they can't identify the people or they can't get them in through collections, then the property owner is ultimately responsible. Does that answer your question, Ken? It, do, it does. And <laughs> uh, uh, 
the problem that I encountered was that I was trying to chase the same person down because he owed me a whale of a lot more than he owed the garbage company. And <laughs> it was pretty much impossible to find. And so you just, you know, suck it up and deal with it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, one of the, some property owners um, will pay for the garbage bill themselves and include that in the cost of rent. So they don't end up in that situation, but that's not a requirement in, in Washington County. City of Portland actually has made that a requirement so that the owner of the property has to provide the service and the account has to be in the owner's name um, not the renter's name but our rules don't dictate that thank you yep um, so but we're excited to see this um, fund go live we're anticipating that we'll be able to start communicating with customers towards the end of August um, about that opportunity that would be available to them uh, so we're looking forward to seeing how that goes and how fast um, it is taken advantage of and used so that's a good thing and do you have any prediction of, of what it's going to cost or what the exposure is already? We've been collecting monthly uh, operational tracking data from the collection companies um, for the last, since through March. And one of the um, line items we're looking at is 90 days past due balance. And we're looking at the growth of the 90 day past due balance as an indicator of, of how much bad debt there might be or how many customers that are not paying um, in each sector. And we've um, taken what we saw through May and into June and then kind of just projected it out to, to look the same. And we're anticipating there will be about $450,000 in, in past due payments um, at the end of the year, um, if it, everything keeps going the way it does is right now. And then we were doing some research on how many, uh, what percent of those kind of customers would qualify or take advantage of a program like this. And we're estimating about 25%. So we're shooting for around, um, Hundred and twenty thousand dollars. What we think it's gonna it's gonna be used, and it is a countywide program, so it's gonna be for customers in the cities as well. <clears throat> but we'll see. It might be more. It might be less. I'm a little bit. I'm I'm a little concerned that the the fund might get used up quicker because folks that aren't necessarily three months behind might um, will also be able to take advantage of it if if they are able to if they become aware of it and they meet the eligibility criteria, they would qualify for the, the assistance, and it wouldn't just be that that chronically past due um, group. So that's not a bad thing per se, but it does mean that those funds might go quicker and, and then the county would have to decide if it has more resources to put into that into that fund to keep it going. I think we're drifting into a real crisis and uh, the rent moratorium or the uh, eviction moratorium didn't forgive people's rent, um, it, it just, allowed it to accrue. And so you're gonna have a whole bunch of people who at the end of when, whenever the cutoff date is, are suddenly deeply in debt to their landlord and probably to their hauler and half a dozen other people. And still, I don't think that the economy or the, the, the nation is going to suddenly jump back into, uh, magically back into full, full speed again. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of people out there with no resources and no real answers. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, the haulers as landlords also are just going to have to accept that it's going to be a real bumpy road for a while. And possibly we, as the people who are holding the bag are not going to get a recovery. Yeah. We'll see what it looks like. <clears throat> I think the rental market is, it's a significantly, you know, bigger rent is, you know, what 11, 1200 bucks and a month and garbage is $30. So the, the scale of it, it will be, significantly larger in the rental market. I, I know that there's programs the county's working on for rent relief too, but it can't possibly meet the need. Um, right. And hopefully the garbage um, you know, assistance program can help meet that kind of middle spot where someone is just hanging on and, and it's just another bill that they are having trouble making payment on and we can kind of keep them with service. That's, that's the goal here is to keep you know, service being going and keep garbage getting out of the properties and collected. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, Beth? Do you have any indication, are any of the haulers uh, at risk? Or is this just an annoyance that, you know, at the end of the year, you wish you'd gotten paid, but it happens? So um, I've been informed of the same data that Tom already mentioned. So we have very similar information. And so not to repeat really what Tom already mentioned, but we do have haulers that are concerned. Uh, Ken, you already said 
you know, the compounded debt, uh, the longer this goes on and the difficulty of climbing back out of it, while our haulers are happy to arrange payment plans, that greater that deficit grows for customers, um, it poses a real challenge. So um, the big question has been how long will this be going on? And as we sit now and we um, kind of comfortably talk about things going through to the end of the year at a minimum, um, that is not what we anticipated, you know, three months ago. So um, that that's a big concern um, that plays into it is how long do we sustain this? So we really, really appreciate Tom um, and the Washington County staffs and and decision makers here going forward with this. This is incredible. I, I don't know of another program like this anywhere. So um, that's that's really commendable to all of them. It certainly is. I agree. Thanks, Beth. And, and Ken, I would try to think about it. So we, we tried to look at <clears throat> bad debt from 2019 average and then what it's looking like halfway through 2020 and we try to separate the difference and that's kind of where we came up with this $450,000 figure. Um, it's a rough estimate. I mean, we're throwing darts at a wall at this point. <laughs> and um, that, so that if you know, if you double that, cause you say half of it is it current is just standard bad debt. That's, you know, $900,000. And this is across the whole County. Um, and if you're thinking about the system, it's 145,000 accounts in the resident sector, um, I would guess it's 70, $80 million um, system. So <clears throat> it is a chunk of change, but it's not, I don't think it's enough that we're going to worried about, you know, folks and cash flow and going out of business. I think we, we, we were worried about that up front, um, what the impact might be. And, and I think we realized that we're going to be able to keep going and we're going to maintain and, and these programs are going to help. And a lot of the haulers got in, um, to, were able to help take advantage of the PPP funds and those um, those federal relief programs. So I think we're gonna, we're doing okay. Um, it's more at this point. I think we're more concerned about folks that are living in the community and if they can't afford their bills anymore. You know what's going to happen with their materials and and let's make sure that it continues to get picked up. And we can't just go on forever with a service termination moratorium because a lot of those customers are just writing it potentially and could pay when they're they're not. So we need to kind of meet, meet that sweet spot in the middle. Yep. <clears throat> All right, um, so next update, um, just kind of a general update about the fact that we're in a new fiscal year now. We're about a month and a half into it already. So we're working on budget adjustments. We, we submitted our budget in November, December. <laughs> Very different uh, idea of what's going on now. So we start, we're working at, internally at the county to try to figure out what we think the impact's gonna be, what kind of revenue reduction we're gonna see. Um, what those estimates look like. We've done some work with Metro who's collecting data on disposal and we're actually seeing at Hillsborough landfill which is a um, construction demolition landfill mostly that tonnage is holding pretty steady which is interesting and I guess that's a sign of the fact that construction didn't really seem to be shut down or slow down through the through the kind of the springtime and it's still going strong so that's tonnage seems to be holding steady at Hillsborough landfill. And then on the collection side, you know, we're anticipating some some reduction in um, in franchise fees coming from you know loss customers and and the, on the commercial sector particularly with the collection haulers. Washington County's composite is is largely weight weighted to the residential sector, so most of the businesses are in the cities. Um, so the effect um, of business like reduction and and reduction in services and and fees from the business sector doesn't impact on incorporated Washington County as much as it would say Hillsboro or Beaverton because we have a predominantly larger um, residential set, slice of the pie. <clears throat> um, another update, um, West Side Rock. Um, I don't know if you've all seen, and we might've mentioned last time, there's a quarry um, south of Cornelius Hillsboro that's owned by Kirk Contractors that got a big violation from DQ, $600,000 fine. Um, there's a neighborhood group that is um, not happy about the situation out there um, and also the Dogami, the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries has given them essentially a, a stop operating order. They can't take in any fill. They can't move anything off the property until they really figure out what's going on there. So they are shut down effectively. Um, DQ's got their big fine on them for accumulation of 
glass that's contaminated with plastic and metal and um, asphalt shingles. Um, so we've been working with DEQ to try to understand what's going on up there. We've determined it's a violation of multiple county codes as well. Um, we have an accumulation of solid waste that's essentially a disposal site that's not franchised. And then we also have a nuisance accumulation through our nuisance code. So yesterday, actually, we issued a notice of violation um, to the quarry on top of DEQ's violation order. And our goal is really to just support DEQ as a local agency. We don't have a $600,000 hammer that DQ does, but we can help DQ and we can signal to the to the owners that this is not okay for Washington County's ordinances either and that we're going to be supporting DQ's investigation and, and inspections of the site. So our code enforcement team will help DQ um, monitor what's going on at the site, do site inspections, and then um, share information as we go through the process of hopefully getting some resolution. I understand DQ is getting some traction with them, so that sounds like a positive thing. They're getting their attention. And it sounds like the more agencies that get involved, the more attention they're giving back to the, to the initial citation. So we'll see how that goes and we're hopeful that we'll get remedied. So where exactly is this quarry? It's off Haggart Road, south of Cornelius. Hmm. Okay. And it's an my... old quarry and it's a reclamation. They're, they're trying to reclaim it. Um, it okay. took a bunch of fill from Intel projects. So that's kind of was a big, destination of the D1X excavation fill. And then I guess they decided that they were gonna take rejected recyclable glass too. So that didn't work out. <laughs> they okay. at one point applied for a land use authorization to do that at their site and they got denied, but they kept doing it, so. Um, another piece of news, Lakeside Reclamation Compost Facility has um, terminate, uh, franchise agreement has officially been terminated with Washington County. Their permit was also um, terminated with DEQ. So Howard Grabhorn was the previous owner. He passed away in 2018 and he left uh, the business and the property to his daughter and she wanted nothing to do with it anymore. So she's been working for about a, two years now to clean it up, get the compost off the property, um, get the equipment off the property and get the um, facility closed and the permits shut out. So we finalized that process just this week and um, it's the end of an era. Our attorney was like, hey, I can retire now. It's been 20 years of battles with Lakeside Reclamation. So it's kind of um, an end to uh, a long standing um, dispute with the county and the state. That was a facility that was had a long history, let's put it that way. Um, another quick update Metro's um, West Side Transfer Station project is continuing to go forward. I'm not sure how much we've shared with you all about that. Metro is looking at a property in Cornelius to develop a transfer station um, on the west side here. And they are going to be presenting to the Board of Commissioners on the 25th. Um, and one Commissioner Juan Carlos Gonzalez will come out uh, with Metro staff and, and give an update to our board. Um, I would be happy to invite Metro staff to this committee too if we're interested in hearing from them about that facility and that um, building process. So if that's something of interest to you all, we can do that. Could also um, share the video of the board meeting where Metro is updating the board as well, so you guys can kind of get an idea of what what they're working on out there. Where are they proposing to put it north of Cornelius? Is it north of Cornelius? Yeah, it's right off Tenth Avenue, I think, right north of um, Corn the Main Street, kind of next north to the Walmart. North of the train tracks or south of the yeah. train tracks? North oh, north of the, of the train track. tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is it the same location they've been looking at? Yeah. The same time. <clears throat> Twelve and a half acre parcel, um, and they have a purchase and sale agreement with the property owner, and they're doing um, some due diligence. They have until February to decide if they're going to purchase or not on that property. So that's my updates. Um, any other questions? Any updates from other staff? Kathy, anybody? Okay, let's uh, move on down. I think the next, I don't see anybody for oral communication. I haven't heard anybody. Um, so let's proceed to um, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee bylaws. Whose turn is that? That's me. Thanks. So this, is Kathy, this is Kathy Balsam. Uh, I just wanted to keep uh, the members of the committee informed of where we're at in this uh, project that I brought 
and presented before you last meeting. Um, since we had our last meeting, we have done a presentation to three different groups. We've gone to the Washington County Holler Association. We've gone to a civic leaders group um, and done a presentation. And then uh, a couple nights ago, we presented to the master recyclers and we basically asked them similar questions of what we asked the committee. Um, additionally, I provided you all with a couple of examples. Mike, who's not here tonight, had asked for, can you, you know, show us some bylaws where there is more intentional representation in the recruitment and the makeup of various um, advisory uh, boards or councils. So uh, I provided you with the Washington County Public Health Advisory Council, as well as the Metro Regional Waste um, Advisory Committee. Uh, both of them have some a lot of detail around the makeup of their um, committee. Uh, not that we necessarily will go that direction, but it just gives you an idea of what is kind of hard to visualize, but seeing it in writing, I hope is helpful. Um, some of the comments we've heard have been rather interesting. Um, some of the same ones I heard from, from you during our meetings, such as around term limits, but um, I know that uh, someone brought up, uh, don't you think you should compensate the, uh, the um, Solid Waste Advisory Committee members because it's a time commitment? And so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, have we thought about having someone re representing the disabled community? Um, someone else was suggesting the youth, you know, a younger, like college student. Um, so people are thinking pretty far ranging and um, I think it's good right now. We're just listening. We're not um, actually have not written uh, anything down yet about sort of where we think a good, a good um, new set of bylaws will go. Um, we may still have another group or two to present to and then ultimately as we start to get towards September, um, we'll start drafting something. We'll be a very, like, taking the current bylaws and making whatever changes we think uh, based on all the comments and our own uh, input we would be beneficial to um, further uh, sort of representing the population that the county, that the committee um, is formed from. So I just wanted to let you know where we're at and who we've talked to and if you had any questions. This is um, an ongoing discussion, so I still, I've, I've gotten a couple of emails from members. Um, go ahead and send me more if, if you have an opinion or a suggestion or you think of something or, you know, some, a thought comes in your head because this really is the time now um, to uh, sort of weigh in on the bylaws that govern uh, both the makeup of the committee as well as um, sort of the do's and don'ts and what the committee, um, you know, like term limits. Or it's interesting, one of the things we've heard from pretty much every group we've talked to um, term is limits. the uh, term limits and the, the fact that it's called the Solid Waste Advisory Committee is very oh, yeah. <laughs> jargony and not welcoming and no one knows what that means really. And we in the industry know what it means. And in, sp in particular, if you translate it into Spanish, it does not translate well. It's basically the poop committee and nobody <laughs> nobody wants to serve on that committee. So uh, we are thinking about <laughs> what maybe renaming. just um, renaming it in common terms like the garbage and recycling advisory committee or, or something that um, is less jargony and maybe is more lay terms. I think solid waste is a term that we use in code and rule and in the industry. Um, and it's not necessarily a term that everyone on the street um, uses. So it's kind of it was kind of funny to hear that feedback too. And we've heard that yeah, throughout we've heard our program. It from everyone. Our bilingual team has not directly translate the name of our program into the solid waste and recycling division. <laughs> it doesn't work. So that's all I had, unless there were some questions. Um, you know, we're 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 intending to try and have a meeting every month. So if we have the September one, we might have something a bit more um, you know, concrete that we could bring back to um, have you all review. 
one of the other things I think we've heard, and we heard that from you all pretty loud and clear too, is that um, it's not really fair for us to ask public members to come together once or twice a year um, and make an informed decision on a complex topic like this. Um, people don't, when we talked to, we were talking to multiple groups about the Solid Waste Advisory Committee and they didn't really, at first they didn't really understand what we were talking about or what questions we had or what they could provide input on because they didn't really understand the committee and the process. And, and I think it is important to recognize that it is, we do have, a, it is a pretty complex industry. And if we're asking someone to serve um, as a public member, member on our committee, we are putting them in a position to be able to speak to um, what we're, or make a recommendation they feel comfortable making to the board. And um, it, it's incumbent upon us as staff to make sure that we help um, people understand their role and we educate the committee members that aren't as in depth um, involved in the business. And we um, meet, I think, more regularly so we can build more of a of a relationship and a culture with each other so that we can um, have better conversations and, and provide informed decision making to the board. Um, so I think those are all th things that we have really thought about and we're really internalizing. And we, we know that it's gonna be a lot of work to, um, to you know, provide more representation. If there's more turnover on the, on the committee, it's gonna be a lot of work and we're gonna have to do a lot of um, extra education efforts, but we're committed to doing that. And I think it's the right thing to do. So. Um, we're interested in, in working with everybody to yeah, do that. That's partly why we're having, you know, we don't have this is the second meeting in a row without an action item, but we hope we're bringing some, you know, topics that will um, help make decisions in the future because uh, they're important, they're important to the system. And the other thing, and Tom just triggered a thought and I, um, that we heard a lot of from was, have they like the idea of not having it always in person like when we get back to that mode like doing do having venues that are easier for members to participate in um, whether that's literally twice a year going to a community center and holding the meeting or having every other time be a virtual zoom meeting instead of in person but we heard that a lot that you're asking a lot to have someone, you know, have to, if, especially if they live quite a ways away, even on, even at night, um, come to an in-person meeting at a government building in the city of Hillsboro. So we're looking at that too, like maybe writing some things around that dynamic. Two, two, two thoughts. First off, I talked with a friend in Minneapolis who was, a, a experienced conference call person. He'd been doing conference calls for 20 years now. And he said, this Zoom business is, is a real problem because people can see you. And you can no longer yeah. keep doing your housework and your other stuff while you sort of listen to the conference call. And he says, you know, we have a two hour meeting and 15 minutes of it is what I'm interested in and I'm stuck. And, and that, that's the first thing I want to comment about Zoom meetings. I, I think that for the people who are having to do them in lieu of conference calls, continuously it's been an eye-opening and, and how to how to change it the other thing a more more serious matter is what kind of pushback are you getting on term limits it took me probably six years to get really up to speed to understand the complexities of a school district when i was on the school mm -hmm. district i think i was on for eight or ten years and i chaired it for four of the years but even so it's a really really nuanced complex system and not surprisingly this is too and so I think if you bring somebody in and plunk them in for two years and they're out again, um, the public contribution will be almost a nil. Um, and I talked to Mike about it and he had the exact same feeling. It just, there were just so many issues that had not come up before. And the haulers have been doing it for 30 years. I mean, they, most of them inherited the business from their dads and they, they know how the business works, but many do not. It could also be one thought that um, you have a maximum number of years. Someone brought, has brought that up before. So it's not so much that you can only serve three years, but that you can only serve for a maximum of 10 years or some pick your number. Yeah, and oh, I, and the, the, the term limits are interesting. Part of it, uh, yeah. um, to be f totally frank, um, part of it is this is a direction from the board is that they don't, they want two or four year terms 
and they want limits on how many terms someone can serve on their committees. So that's pretty broad. I mean, now we're, we're talking about four year term and say two consecutive, that's eight years. That's a long time. It is. Um, yeah. And, and so that's, that's a part of the board's priority. Um, another um, from community, I think people perceive term limits as just more people have the opportunity to have their voice said, voice right. heard and more opportunity to serve. But that assumes that there's a line of people waiting to serve on the committee. <laughs> um, that it's going to be really tough. I think to recruit <laughs> if we had two year terms and, we're going to be recruiting all the time and it's going to be really tough right. to get people on the committee. So I don't think two is reasonable. I think four is maybe more reasonable in line with the board's um, criteria. And then, um, you know, just trying to figure out what's the, what's the sweet spot between getting enough people that are experienced and that feel comfortable in the conversations on the committee and then some new people being able to rotate in as, rotate in as well. So it is, a, it is, a, I, I think a really fine um, dance. And I heard, um, the suggestion that one of the ways you sort of bridge that I'm new and I don't have as much knowledge is you add members to the committee so that your more experienced ones are still there and you and you you know rotate or offset the new over time and don't do it so abruptly that um, you end up with that situation where someone just got up to speed and now they're off yeah, and 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 you know, I I hate to think where I would have been if I hadn't had Jeff Murray to explain things to me along the way because he had literally been in it since he was a child and he was able to explain things in a way at least that I understood completely and how it got there, why it was beneficial, and um, <laughs> deal with my objections. So I, I think that experience is, uh, uh, and being my age, I like experience. So. Uh, anyway, I just, I want to caution people and, and I'm, I think eight years is absolutely the low end of what it ought to be. Uh, well, so. you know, Ken, and that's balanced against the fact that you had a desire to learn, an interest to learn, and to serve, right? So as right. we talk about terms, we do need to think about how we address some of these little more, I don't want to call them extracurricular, but some of these things that influence those folks that come into this that have a desire to learn, not just to put it on a resume or something. I'm not saying that folks would do that, but it is something that we have to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and recruitment will become a really big part of um, the, if there's new positions that are identified for certain interest groups, um, recruiting is gonna be really important and really tough. So it's gonna be a lot of work. I agree. So next we have um, 2021 work plan. Did we cover that? Oh, no. is that is that it? Everybody, anybody else have any questions? Um, are we ready to move over? Nope. <clears throat> and this one, I'm going to turn over to Kim and Jennifer. Tom, were you going to kind of give us a little intro? Yeah, sorry. I told him I was going to introduce him, and then I said, "Welcome, Kim and Jennifer." <laughs> yeah, so Kim and Jennifer introduced themselves at the beginning of the meeting. So Kim is our community outreach coordinator and Jennifer is our green business coordinator. And they are both kind of lead the two sides of our education outreach work. Um, so obviously Kim works on the community outreach side. Normally they'd be out at community events, educating at farmers markets and special events. Now they're creating YouTube videos and trash talk Tuesdays, but we're going to get back to it someday. Um, and Jen's team is uh, surprisingly still getting requests for assistance from businesses. Um, we're still working um, from our desks and our homes on the business outreach side of things. So I asked them to come today to see if they can give you all an update, kind of a big broad overview, 30,000 foot level about our work plan for fiscal year 2021. So thanks Jen and Kim and I will turn it over to you. Thanks Tom. Okay. All right, I'm going to share my screen and get our PowerPoint queued up. Don't worry, it's just a couple slides. Mm -hmm. so, not going to go nuts here. All right, everyone can see that okay? Cool, great. Cool. So as Jen and I were kind of working through this, we thought rather than go through every single line item in our 
work plan that we would pull out a couple of main themes that we have seen sort of coalesce as we've been planning for this next year. Um, and then kind of highlight some of the projects that we're really excited about um, and share those with you. And you know, we're very open to questions and to talking about it further. Um, obviously with COVID, our plan is a little bit different than it would be in a normal year. Um, we're also kind of looking more at a shorter time period. So planning, you know, three to six months at a time because um, the landscape could change very dramatically again. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, so with our first slide, our first goal here is to lead with racial equity. Um, and that's been a theme across all of our programs, across our division, and um, really starting to be across the county as well. And for us, that means prioritizing access to resources for underserved communities of color in Washington County. Um, and two projects that I kind of want to highlight under that um, umbrella. One is that in partnership with Metro and Central Cultural, um, we've been doing a program called the Promotoris Ambientalis for environmental promoters, and that's a community-based master recycler class um, that's taught entirely in Spanish. And then at the end, the master recyclers um, get their 30 hours, they get certified, and then they continue to serve um, doing education outreach um, to the Latino community, and they continue to receive a stipend over that time. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a very cool partnership that's had some really exciting results. Um, they've been very active during this time as well. They're doing a lot of videos, they're doing a lot of webinars. Um, and we've been meeting again with Metro, um, with Master Recyclers, with Centro, and we're going to proceed with doing another class in the fall, another cohort, and it's going to be all online. Um, so for the Master Recyclers in the group, Lauren Norris is a little, a little overwhelmed, but she's on board and she's excited. Um, so right now we're kind of planning how that looks, how we do recruitment, how we provide technology, um, how we help, you know, if people are even going to still be interested and have the time and space if schools aren't open, things like that. So that's where we're at with that one. Um, and then another project that I'm excited about is we're working on offering more of our materials in all of Washington County's Safe Harbor languages. Uh, so Safe Harbor language is um, either 5% of the expected served population or at least 1,000 um, members speak that language. And in Washington County, we have and um, 11 languages, I think. I have a list of 11 that fall under that category. Um, so that includes Arabic, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Khmer, Korean, Persian, Russian, Somali, Vietnamese, and Spanish. Um, so while it's not yet, there's sort of some county policy around making, figuring out which materials are going to be mandatory to be provided in all those. We've kind of gotten ahead of it and translated some of our community outreach materials like our collection calendars, our waste prevention guide, and our recycling flyers into those languages. Um, and we're currently working on a way where we can have, have members of the community review the translations and make sure that they're on point and that they make sense. Um, one example is, uh, before I started working here, but I've heard about it, but um, we had our recycling flyer translated into Spanish and the word clamshell was translated very literally. So instead of clamshell, like a packaging clamshell is translated more like um, a sea creature. So we just want to make sure that some of those technical terms, um, we're not putting materials in the community without doing our due diligence to make sure that they, they make sense and they're appropriate. Or solid waste. <laughs> or so, yep, there you go. That's a great example. All right, and then kick it to Jen for the next slide. Um, yeah, so, um, as COVID came to us um, in March, um, the word pivot, I think, has become the new term. Um, I hear that a lot with um, not only our program, but um, certainly just many other colleagues and friends who are, are working and, and pivoting. So, um, so our, our pivot is really, um, you know, around how we do outreach and you know, obviously the outreach that we do is typically um, in-person, on-site events, tabling, delivery of materials, um, you know, you name it, really getting out to, into the community, whether it's the business community or um, multifamily, um, just connecting with our communities. And so we've had to uh, really just kind of look at all angles and aspects of, of how we do our outreach and 
start to slowly create um, different ways of, of doing that. And so, um, you know, as this first one says, we've been developing a lot of virtual and video libraries, virtual based presentation for um, different audiences. And, um, and those are being um, shown on, well, we're getting ready to start this launch of the campaign and they'll be shown on Facebook and YouTube and um, just making them really accessible along with um, having, making sure that they're available in Spanish. Um, some of our presentations that we've had that we typically uh, give to community groups or business groups, um, we're looking at those and updating them and making them available to community groups or businesses if they would like to have a, a member of their group present. So we are creating these presentations where we can hand them off and we'll have information for whomever is presenting the information. We'll have uh, notes that they can refer to um, or we will set up a virtual Zoom and present this information to anyone who wants to have us, um, you know, come out and speak to them about anything from basics of recycling to uh, some of our more advanced information, informational presentations that uh, talk more about materials and life cycle analysis and things like that. So, um, so using formats like Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and so as um, was mentioned earlier, the Trash Talk Tuesday, which this image that we have here was something that the whole staff got together and did, and it was sort of a Brady Bunch themed um, Trash Talk Tuesday, and um, it came together pretty well. We luckily have uh, one of uh, the business team staff is um, very well versed in video editing, and so we've been uh, really fortunate to have her uh, just kind of cranking through a lot of videos and doing a great job. Um, and then, you know, just kind of as uh, Tom mentioned, we have, we are still getting a few requests for resources. So I've done a few bin deliveries where I've just dropped off some recycling bins at the doorstep of a business and, and or uh, met someone outside, you know, following all safety protocols, keeping distance, wearing masks, that kind of thing. Um, so folks are still, you know, very much interested in in receiving those materials. Um, and uh, as far as, you know, business goes with the Green Business Leaders Program, we're still looking at ways that we're gonna host some virtual content, um, copy hours, um, and, you know, just continue to connect with our business community. But um, we're also looking at doing some surveys and, and just reaching out to folks and kind of meet them where they're at, see what kind of uh, materials and resources they need at this point, you know, the business landscape may look very different six, six months from now. So um, we're just really gonna start the process of touching base with our business community and, um, and see where, how we can serve them. So take it away, Kim. I'll also say the, the intro is very funny to film because there's a little bit of a, a delay on Microsoft Teams. So it was supposed to be more or less in unison. It is definitely not. Um, I hope you'll, once we launch it, I hope you'll take a look. We think it's charming. Hopefully other people will too. Um, it was fun to film. All right, and then our final point is just to continue fulfilling our core mission with excellence um, by strengthening our existing programs, resources, and partnerships. Um, I think Tom likes to remind us sometimes that every time we add something, we're not taking anything away. And we already have a really solid suite of communications channels, of programs, um, and of partnerships that we've formed. Um, so getting back to some of our core functions and making sure that um, we're really reaching our audiences, that we're con continuing to meet and collaborate with our partner organizations. Um, one thing that comes to mind for me is a little bit of the comms lead is, you know, right now our constant contact, our electronic newsletter, it goes out quarterly to about 5,000 people. Um, which is a great number and we get a great open rate, but we could increase that to even more people. Our Facebook has about a thousand likes. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people in the county. There's a lot of ways that we can use the channels that we already have that are already sort of COVID safe and be reaching more people and getting our education and outreach out to more people. So I, that's all we have in terms of the slides. Um, thank you so much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing screen unless anyone wants me to go back to a slide. Actually, maybe I'll leave it up in case someone wants to go back. 
Okay, um, thank you. Can we go on to the Metro Code Administrative Rules proceeding? Sure, are there any questions on the work plan for as I get my screen share set up? What does Andalante Mujeres mean? Uh, it translates to sort of let's go women and it's an organization that's founded um, to sort of serve Latino women and girls. Oh, good. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it was just beyond my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> totally reasonable. Yeah. The Muharis, the Muharis part I got, but they and the Andalante, but I couldn't put them together. So, all right. Well, if there's no questions, I think Jen and I are um, going to quietly sneak off. But thank you all. It's good to see you. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks, Kim. Thanks all can, for your time. Can you guys see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yeah. Is it only my PowerPoint you see, or everything else on my computer? No, just your PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, no, I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sorry. I see all the stuff across the top, too. The... Okay. Oh, I sometimes my. wonder if everyone's, like, looking at my notes and my emails, and I don't really know what's going on. But <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Uh, there you go. <clears throat> so this is a, another topic that is dense. I will put, give you a heads up here. We did send along, um, Kathy sent an email um, last week with um, three chapters of Metro's administrative rules. Um, these are changes to Metro rules and code that um, some are new, some are not. Metro's got doing a pretty large, change my slide here, a pretty large um, update <clears throat> on their administrative rules and their code in regards to what they call the regional service standards, which essentially are requirements for local governments um, for us, um, our programs. So most of it <clears throat> is because Metro felt its code was out of date. It was disorganized. There was some pieces here and some over here. So they wanted to kind of clean it up, <clears throat> make it more streamlined. <clears throat> and they're also adding some elements, um, some new elements that are from the regional waste plan um, into their new administrative rules. And those are mainly around um, multifamily recycling requirements. And then they've reorganized their um, code and rules to kind of make the code more general and the rules more specific. So this is pretty wonky policy development stuff, but I wanted to give you all an opportunity to see the rules that they're working on. And I think we should think about, I'm not asking, I don't think we want to ask you guys to react to the rules right now in, in this meeting, in this setting, but you have the draft rules um, that we sent an email to you and then we can kind of talk about them here. And if you have any thoughts and feedback, um, they will have a public comment period coming up in the next month. So you are all welcome as individuals to give comment, or if the committee is interested, we could um, work to give comment to Metro on their rules from the committee too. So I just wanna give that as an opportunity um, and think about that as I'm talking about these specifics. <clears throat> um, so, sorry, I have a guest coming into my office here. Let me... Um, so chapter 2000 is one of the new um, chapters that we gave you the um, copy of their draft. And chapter 2000 um, really is regarding single family residential programs. So this is the individual service to households. Um, they, one of the big changes for Westside particularly, because we have pretty much the only alternative programs they call them where um, the Metro service standard is that <laughs> Sorry, the Metro service standard is that they have weekly recycling, weekly garbage, and weekly um, yard debris collection. In Washington County, we have several jurisdictions, including unincorporated, where we have every other week recycling and every other week yard debris. And in Metro's eyes, that's considered an alternative program. Uh, we've spent years proving to Metro that they, we, our programs perform as well as other weekly programs. Um, there was a big study in 2015 where we, we did better than Lake Oswego that has every week. So. Um, I think we've proven over time that our every other week program uh, performs as well as some weekly programs. So there's not a need to move into weekly for unincorporated. So one of the things they are doing in these new rules, though, is they're eliminating the alternative program. That doesn't mean they're going to make us go to weekly. They are going to grandfather in alternative programs that have been in place um, since January of or December of 2019, something along those lines, and not let new jurisdictions start alternative programs, which 
I don't necessarily know if I like that because I feel like if, it, if they perform as well, I don't know if we should stifle other jurisdictions from having the opportunity to, to adjust their programs as well. Um, one of the things that we've been pushing back on pretty hard, um, they are, they have, they did prove over time that monthly glass collection programs do not perform as well as every other week or weekly glass collection. So they had put in their rules that you have a, a draft copy of that glass um, will be, glass collection programs will be required to be either every other week or weekly. Um, so our, our pushback from that, that really affects Tigard and um, Sherwood in our, in our cooperative service area on the west side. And our pushback from that was we didn't think it was fair to tell Tigard they had to adjust their glass more frequently, but they couldn't adjust their recycling to match or offset some of the increased costs of that program. So they have dropped the um, requirement to move glass to, um, away from monthly. And they're, um, they're saying that they're going to wait until DQ and some new rules and legislation that DQ is working on go through before they make those kinds of changes that would require cities to really adjust their programs. So there's more to come there. Um, it's kind of interesting because the alternative program is a hot topic for us on the west side, but everybody else doesn't care because they'll have weekly. So I'm the only squeaky wheel in the, many of those conversations. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of funny. Another thing they did on the um, single family side is they added food waste um, to residential collection as an optional service for, and it can be allowed at every other week frequency, which was a, a pretty big debate. There was a debate over whether they would require it to be weekly, if you had it, or if they would let it stay at every other week. Um, City of Hillsboro has an every other week food scraps collection program and it's the only one in the region and it seems to be performing well. Carl can maybe give us the thumbs up on that. Um, and um, we're happy to see that they recognize that that's an acceptable approach as well. Um, another thing that kind of relates back to what your comment was or question was earlier, Ken, um, they clarified that property owners must ensure service for renters. Um, the way this was originally written, it, we interpreted that as property owners had to provide the service um, to renters, similar to what I've mentioned Portland does. That would be a pretty major shift um, in unincorporated in the west side asking all the renters to cancel their accounts and all the landlords to start new accounts in their names. And, and we don't think that that's necessary because it doesn't seem to be too big of a problem for us. But we clarified it to make, um, basically it was clarified to read that property owners could not prevent occupants from recycling. So a property owner can't say, no, you can't recycle in my rental. Um, they have to be able to provide the opportunity to recycle to their to their tenants. Um, we have similar provisions in all of our business um, recycling requirement rules and codes. So a, a business property owner can't say no business X, you cannot have recycling um, because we don't like it or for whatever reason we don't have space for it. So they have to be able to provide the opportunity to the renters. <clears throat> so those are the, the hot topics in chapter 2000. Let's see, next. So is, is the uh, food waste for um, uh, unincorporated now? So there is not a food waste program for unincorporated yet. It is kind of a, yeah, no. it's a chicken and egg thing a little bit with um, capacity for transfer and, dis and processing. Carl could um, speak to that a little bit too as for his experience for major's needs. We have 63,000 residential accounts and that's a lot of material and it's a lot of trucks. So we're really nervous about that going straight um, directly to nature's needs, which is where the other jurisdictions are going. Um, and then now, um, so we're kind of waiting for some intermediary transfer opportunities to, to arrive. Um, and we'll see where that, when that comes online. You know, Pride is working on, um, I think they have actually maybe now started to open their new facility upgrade and they could accept that material. There's South County, obviously a West Side transfer station um, that Metro would own and operate in Cornelius would change that um, picture dramatically. Um, and now, of course, we're concerned about what COVID is going to do to the to the rates and the systems. And if we want to start new programs in the spring, um, what kind of rate impacts piling it all on would look like. So we have a lot to look about, look at, and think about. We do get a lot of calls from community members that want food scraps. Um, so I think it's coming. We just need to to hit it right. And I'm sorry, I keep saying that. I know. Thank you, Sandra, for reminding us. <laughs> So chapter 2000 is also um, has the multifamily requirements. This is where the biggest change is. Um, will have the biggest effect on us and the, the haulers in the system. Um, the big changes here are um, there's new container color coding standards 
and new regional decal standards. So essentially there's new standards that say by date X, I think it's seven years out from the date that the rules adopted in multifamily properties, all recycling dumpsters will be blue, all the garbage dumpsters will be gray, and all of yard debris or organics will be green, and glass will be orange. Um, so it's a big change. Right now we have pretty much all kinds of different colors um, in the dumpsters. And part of this is um, based on studies um, in the Seattle area and the Seattle market about successful multifamily recycling programs. And one of the big things that they've, we've drawn in on is the fact that color coding is a really large signal to a community member about what that bin is for. So if you can say, put it in the blue bin, it's a lot more successful than um, put it in the bin that looks like it has recycling in it and a recycling sticker on it. So I think that's part of the messaging there. Um, part of that is also a regional decal. So Metro has um, finalized a decal that is going to be consistent across the region. So all dumpsters and multifamily properties will have the same sticker, the same recycling sticker, have the same um, content on it, the same information in multiple languages and larger sizes. Um, and all of those sticker dumpsters will have to be stickered with that um, regional decal. The other part of the new multifamily standard is going to be service minimum standards. Um, this would be applied essentially to the property owners. And the standards that are proposed in their rules are uh, 20 gallons per week per unit um, for garbage, 20 gallons per week per unit for recycling, and one gallon per week per unit for glass. Um, that is, I think, a true minimum. Um, if you think about 75 uh, or so percent of households in the single family side of things are receiving a 35 gallon per week um, garbage service and uh, presumably, let's see, a, a 45 gallons per week of um, recycling. This is quite a bit less than that. We could assume um, that they might not generate as much waste, but our research has shown that most single family, most multifamily properties are meeting this standard in terms of garbage. Um, and, and a lot of them might need to up their recycling because they just don't bring up as there's much recycling volume. So it will be a change. It'll be an adjustment for the multifamily property owners. Um, and I think it's, um, it is a true minimum. It's not an ambitious target and it's not gonna have a bunch of extra garbage capacity laying around is, is based on the research we've seen. And then glass is another challenge. Glass is often a difficult um, material stream for properties to manage. Um, it breaks, it takes more containers in their enclosures. And so oftentimes they will remove glass service or, or have really tiny glass service that is not, doesn't work for the, for the community members. So these are the new standards. These um, will certainly add um, presumably costs to the system. Um, Painting and purchasing and acquiring new containers is not free. There will be a cost there for the collectors. Metro, I think, has landed on a seven-year um, window for replacement. And that kind of lines up with a depreciation schedule for um, equipment that the haulers use when they're purchasing new equipment. And then um, the minimum service standards still need to be talked about how that's going to be, would be implemented or rolled out, but that might have a, a financial impact on some property owners as well. So I'll kind of stop there if there's any questions on the multifamily or comments or and this I would I would say too this this will require us to come back to your committee um, to adopt rules for unincorporated Washington County. So if Metro adopts these rules, they would mean that we have to have this included in our system. The way we do that in unincorporated is we put those into our administrative rules. So we would be back here talking about the specific rules that we would be inserting into our our system um, that would meet these standards. Okay. Next we have chapter 3000 and 4000 are the new chapters regarding business um, service standards. Not much changes here. It's just kind of a reorganization. So kind of a refresh of the business recycling requirements. Um, there's a bunch of obsolete dates in their old rules about in 2009 or 2010, this has to happen. So those will all come out. We already have a business recycling requirement in our rules um, in Washington County. And then chapter 4,000 will be the business food waste requirement. Um, this one will be adjusted to start on March, 20, March 31 of 2021 instead of 2020, which we had originally adopted. 
Um, so we will be looking at some changes there. So we also have to change those dates in our rules because we plan to start this March and obviously something else happened. And we delayed that. Um, so that's going to come back again in the fall and winter as part of our rule um, planned rule package that we're going to be bringing back. But nothing else there really changes. Um, and then finally, uh, there's chapter 5000, which is more of a general um, education standards. Um, they add language about um, making sure our materials are culturally responsive and um, consider more cultural elements. Um, consider that we require that the haulers information being provided also meets those same standards um, and, and providing direct form performance feedback to customers, which we um, consider misprep tags or, or notices or, or letters to customers about contamination potentially in their, in their recycling systems. And we are asking for clarification on how they are gonna determine cultural relevancy because um, if we're gonna be determining that um, for materials that are in collateral that's um, being used by the, by the franchise haulers, I think it's important to really define these terms and not just talk about them so that we can be um, as honest about them as we can and, and create the best kind of materials we can. Another piece that was in here that has um, kind of been removed, but the concept will still come into play is one of the regional waste plan elements was that we would provide better education and information about what you're paying for in your garbage rate to community members. That was a proposed rule. There was a lot of concern about who that applied to, how do we tell a multifamily resident about their garbage rate because it's really the rate for the property owner. And so there's a lot to be determined there, but that's gonna be some work over the next year or two is, is how do we, as an industry, figure out a better way to communicate with our community members about what, what their garbage rate is, why it is, and what that pays for. Um, that was one of the big things that came out of the regional waste plan. So um, that's gonna be an interesting um, project as well. I think I envision you know, pie graphs about this much is for disposal, this much is for labor, and some kind of simple um, estimations of what your rate is made up from, fact sheets, um, more, transparent rate sheets. I think we do a good job on our rate sheets, but I can tell you some of the cities, I, I don't even know how to find them. You have to go look in their resolution and orders to know what the rates are in that jurisdiction. So I think part of that is just a little bit more transparency on that front. <clears throat> when, when, so, you delve uh, into, when, when you delve into this, I, I have no problem with Washington County, but I'm, I'm offended by Metro, which I feel does not clarify that the significant part of the tipping fee goes to support Metro overhead and other things that Metro thinks are worthwhile, but they have no other source of funds. And so garbage is basically, or solid waste, is basically seen as sort of a captive thing. We, the city of Portland got in trouble with their water bureau for doing the same thing with their water rates. And I wanna make sure that we make it clear to the people in the county that garbage rates are not supporting a bunch of things that I believe are worthwhile, but they, they ought to be supported in some other way. So we shouldn't be paying for the zoo or for wetlands or other things that Metro feels are critically important and we're the source of funds. Yeah, um, they're actually getting sued for that right now. Oh, are they? Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it is interesting, Ken, I, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. And I would say that a lot of local governments use franchise fees to pay for core city services. So a lot of cities that don't have solid waste programs and funds are using franchise fees to pay for police and fire and other core services. City of Gresham is a good example. They just increased their franchise fee to 10% because they are having a revenue challenge and they can't raise um, fees for the city services in other places. So I think transparency is really important and we should be aware that um, maybe our garbage rates are paying for core city services. And if they are, we should be talking about that. Um, in Unincorporated, we, we do generate more revenue than our program spends. Um, we contribute about two hundred dollars to $300,000 to the general fund. Um, and that is the general fund for public health. Um, so right now is not a good time for me to ask for the, some of that back because public health is, is having, has their hands full. Um, but at the same time, we've been kind of historically making the argument internally that this, this revenue is being generated from the solid waste system. We believe it should be spent to regulate and talk about garbage. Um, so we wanna spend that money to oversee the system and we wanna spend that money to provide information and resources to, to make that system more sustainable. So I think that's a, a constant argument um, or struggle, not argument per se, but 
it's a it's a challenge for lots of local governments to to look at that. But I think transparency is important, and you're right. Well, and and it, this is not a new problem. And Washington County has in their code that elementary schools have to be built on 10 acres of land and high schools have to be built on 50 acres of land or something like that because somebody back in the early 50s decided that the school districts had all the money in the world so they could be the providers of parks whereas on the flip side the city of portland mandated that their parks department put a park next to every school and and, and it was just who who had to pay for it but this is not a new problem <laughs> yeah absolutely so this is my kind of summary slide here. Most of, most of these adjustments in Metro's rules are not going to have major impacts on our system or on our rules. Most of them are realignment, housekeeping, reorganization. It looks like a completely new package. Even the first time I read it, I was circling things and I, oh, oh my God, this is then I'm like, oh, those have been there for 15 years. <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't mean it's another good opportunity to take a look at them. Um, and the multifamily rules and the multifamily requirements will certainly have an impact on our system and our program. And that will require quite a bit of work um, through this committee, through rulemaking, through the board, and with the haulers in terms of um, how we're meeting those requirements. So uh, the minimum service levels, the color coding requirements, and the decal requirements are the three biggest things I think we're going to be um, that are going to impact us through this. I think they're all good things um, in my mind. I think they're, they will benefit the multifamily system. We just have to know that they're gonna come with a cost and we have to understand what that is and, and how that's gonna be paid for and, and what that might do to the rates. Um, so that's gonna be a big part of the discussion and we'll try to figure that out as we move along. So that is what I have. Oh, next steps, public comment period, I said in September, 2020. Um, if anybody's interested in um, comments, please let me know or you can send them yourself. I can send out the link when it goes live um, or if the committee is interested, we could comment as a solid waste advisory committee. Um, they are gonna be continuing to seek stakeholder engagement throughout the summer and they plan to take their um, package to their council in the winter um, for adoption. So at the, around the same time, we'll probably be doing a similar process and unincorporated. Banad? And just, quick, just a quick question. Is it common for the, the, the SWAC to comment as a group on public comments to metro changes or anything? It has not necessarily been in the past, but we're trying to be more proactive with this kind of um, stuff and bring this to you all before it just shows up as a recommendation from us for our rules. Um, so I think that is something we can talk about as a committee if, if you're all interested in that. I wanna stress um, that as a member of the committee, you can't speak on behalf of the committee we need to channel them to Tom and then put them forward and have to take a vote and have the committee then speak as a voice and go forward. It, the, the, I think we should attempt to commit comment on some of these metro rules. I, I think that's a good thing, but I think procedurally we need to make sure that we cross our T's and dot our I's and that, that when we speak as the committee, it is actually the committee that is doing it, uh, not some member of the committee. Yeah, thanks Ken, I think that's really important. Thanks for clarifying that too. Um, as an individual, you're welcome to do whatever you say, what, <laughs> submit whatever comment you wish. Just <laughs> and, and you can submit your individual comment as a member of the committee, just you can't speak for the committee. Yeah. Anything I else? Go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, and Tom, you can tell me if, if I'm outside the agenda here, but uh, you mentioned rates, and I think most of us, at least in industry, are well aware about Metro's um, initial proposal of $8.85 increase, originally effective October 1, and then they're pushing it back. Have Have you heard, and this is, I don't mean to put you on the spot, it's okay to say, I don't know, because I'm asking you because I don't know myself. Um, what the process will be. I know that they're pushing back and looking at a rate increase sometime in 2021, but I believe there will be an opportunity for public comment. Can you speak to that at all? Or if not, that's fine, but. I believe there will as well. I think it goes that the council action, Metro Council. It is, um, for it sure. Is. I believe it is. Okay. Um, and <laughs> you, you said it is for sure, so you know. No, no, I, oh. I, I, I believe so, but I have no um, certainty, absolute certainty on that. 
Yeah. Um, you know what, Beth, I don't really either. This will be my first cycle um, in this role with Metro's um, rate increases. I presume it goes through their council. Um, I don't recall in the past them doing a very robust public um, comment process like they would for their rules or their code for the rates. Um, but I think anything that goes to their council is going to have an opportunity for comment included in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty vague. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's fine. I mean, it's my understanding that there would be an opportunity for public comment and that might be something, um, you know, I don't know if, if this group would be interested in, in any of that. I have no idea, you know, even the groups I represent don't yet have positions on this because it's too early, but um, that's a big, uh, those are big numbers that have been kicked around and I know that local jurisdictions, um, if those kinds of rate increase come they'll the local jurisdictions will have to do a, a metro increase and it would make a lot more sense to me for the public to be commenting to metro and not to the county commissioners and to every city that um, if it's a metro increase metro should be it just seems more efficient <laughs> yeah i would agree <clears throat> And I, I know, I, I think we talked about, mentioned it maybe last uh, meeting, but Beth's alluding to uh, Metro's uh, proposal to do a rate increase initially. It was October 1st, $9 a ton, which is pretty significant. Um, we had a lot of concern from the local government side about the timing. It's, we're still in experiencing economic hardship and we still have COVID in our community and we don't think it's a good time to raise the rates so significantly. Um, they are experiencing, you know, um, a, challenges because their tonnage is down. Um, they, their costs are up um, for the new facility agreements at South. They have new more staff, um, I think more Metro staff that are doing traffic control at South. So they've done some improvements and signed some agreements in the last year um, plus that have increased their costs. Um, so they have less waste, less tonnage to spread those costs out over the, over the system. And so that's resulting in a lot of pressure on the rates. Um, pretty significant numbers um, and they would have an impact on our collectors and presumably that would flow down to our ratepayers. Um, so it is concerning at this time and just the timing of it, I think we're, we're mostly concerned about and then also the, if it's an off cycle increase, so it's a, it was October or if it's January, it's, it's hard to evaluate those kinds of increases when we're not in the middle of rate review or doing rate adjustments across the region. So. Um, we'll see what it plays out to be. I know they're still working on it. Kathy has her hand raised there. Can I make a comment? I was just, just to put it in context, I just a couple days ago did like a cost breakdown of what like a resident, the average residential rate pays for and disposal and processing together, which includes the cost of, rec of processing recyclables as well is the largest component of um, residential rates. It's not, it's not, it's like 30, oh, around 30%, which just, you might have thought it was fuel, trucks, labor, some of the other components, but really um, disposal is uh, the biggest component, at least on residential. And that kind of relates to the question about food scraps, Sandra, where <clears throat> new programs cost money too. So if we already have upward pressure on our rates from COVID and rate increases from Metro, it makes it more difficult for the board to feel comfortable also adding on new programs that might increase costs. So we're concerned about the whole package and what it's gonna look like. Um, it's still really early to know what, what we're gonna be dealing with next year during rate review or when we're looking in the fall with, the, with our interim processes. But, um, we're going to keep a close eye on it. Okay, we don't have any public comments, so. Um, nope. Any other questions about anything or everybody ready to call it the night? I know Vinod is. He's been on a conference call for like seven hours today, probably. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they're Me they're marathons. <laughs> I was behind the scenes. Vinod got to be up front. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The face. Thank you all for coming, and uh, 
We'll see you the next month or two. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. That concludes the August 13th SWAC committee meeting. This meeting has been recorded and you can find it on our webpage.